61A Lecture 32 Q&A. All right, while we wait for the first call, John, let's answer an important question. Is it SQL or SQL? It's such a good question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know when people started calling it SQL, but that's what I call it in like in my life. Uh, such a nice thing to say. Yeah, I like it. I think most people say SQL now, although it didn't used to always be like that. Right. Yeah. It's not so clear that you'll someone will think you're strange if you call it SQL. Yeah, that's the main question I was asking. Well, you look like a noob if you uh, if you say SQL. I think, <laughs> yeah. <you're safe. laughs> I think the answer is no, it's fine. Right. The next question was whether it's common to represent trees using SQL as opposed to data that's not uh, hierarchically structured. I don't, I don't know if that tree structure is common. I think that's just probably an artifact of the example that John used. John? Yeah, I think that's right. So um, the, the way in which a table is structured is it's just a bunch of rows, a bunch of entities. But what's interesting is that you can represent all kinds of more interesting structures from that just by, you know, for example, describing the parent relationship in a tree or uh, the connected relationship in, you know, some kind of network. So I, I guess the point of that example was to show that what you're trying to describe doesn't always look tabular, and yet you can use a table to describe it, or maybe several tables, and that's kind of the, the art that you get about building databases that uh, comes with experience. Yeah, good question. So uh, you found one of the topics that we've removed from this semester, but uh, I'll, I'll talk about it anyway for a minute, which is about dynamic scope, which is different from lexical scope, which is what you're used to. So lexical scope basically says that um, the, all, all of the variables within a function can be identified just by looking at the code. So uh, this is true in Python. If you have an inner function, like uh, the adder function within make adder, you can see all the names within the adder function in the code. They might be part of the adder function. They might be part of the make adder function, the enclosing scope, but they're all kind of there. That's what's called lexical scope. It's the most common way in which programming languages work. Uh, in uh, uh, other offerings of this course, we talk about an alternative called dynamic scope, which is hardly ever used. It's kind of interesting um, intellectually, and there are a few cases where it gets used, but mostly it doesn't exist in modern programming languages. So for that reason, it's fine to just not know about it. But if you want to know about it, the, the story is basically that you, um, when you call a function, that function's environment inherits all of the names that already existed from wherever it was called. And um, that means that when you look at the body of the function, it might have names in it that you just you can't see anywhere in the code because they're actually defined where that function is called, maybe in a different file or something like that. Um, and uh, dynamic scope allows you to kind of set up your environment and then make a function call, which is pretty different from lexical scope where you have to pass in everything that's relevant. Um, but uh, it, for that reason, it can simplify some things where instead of like passing in seven different arguments, you just kind of have them already and uh, you don't have to pass any of them in. Uh, so that's kind of the story with dynamic scope is that uh, it, it's just the same as lexical scope, except for the parent of a frame is always the frame from which that function was called as opposed to where that function was defined. So the question is, when you evaluate some block, some scheme expression or set of scheme expressions, how many times does the eval function get called in the scheme interpreter, especially when you have special forms involved? And with special forms, every special form has its own rules about what parts get evaluated when. So um, the most important special form is if, because it skips evaluating part of it, but some parts do get evaluated. So if you wonder like uh, if plus uh, one, two, equals three, then uh, what should we do? Compute that. Uh, well, how about we print five, otherwise we print six. You actually have to call eval a lot of times in order to evaluate this. You have to call eval on the entire expression. That's what happens first, actually. 
And then it's up to the rules of the special form to decide what to evaluate next. So the next thing you evaluate always in an if is that first predicate expression because you have to decide which of these two you're gonna evaluate and you don't know in the beginning. So this is just something that's a rule of if is that you always evaluate the first expression and then you pick and you evaluate either the first or the second. Now, evaluating this actually is quite a bit of work. You have to evaluate this symbol to figure out what you're calling. You have to evaluate this whole expression. You have to evaluate this whole expression. This is a combination, which means you have to evaluate this symbol to figure out what you're calling and evaluate this number to figure out what you're calling it on and this number. So we've actually called eval once, twice, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times already. Now we figure out that three really does equal three and it's time to then evaluate either this or this. Well, we'll evaluate the first one. So we call eval on print five, six. Print five, six is a call expression, which means we recursively call eval on the operator to figure out that we're printing and the operand to figure out that we're printing the number five. And then I think that's all the evals that we're gonna call. So uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 calls to eval in total is what you'd get if you traced through the interpreter while it was evaluating this program and saw how many times eval got called. Great, so let's do one more example where we've defined a uh, user-defined procedure like uh, cube x, which what does that do? That multiplies x by x by x. And then we'll cube uh, one plus two, let's say. When you evaluate this, notice I'm always evaluating like a whole expression first. That's what happens is you pass the whole expression into eval and say, eval, what the heck do I do with this? When you evaluate a whole expression that starts with define, it doesn't end up evaluating anything else, right? Because that's the whole story with uh, procedure definition is that you don't evaluate the body until later when you call it. So that's just one call to eval. The next call to eval would be on this whole thing where you have to figure out what you're calling by evaluating that symbol. You have to figure out what you're calling it on. Now, what you're calling it on is not the expression plus one, two, it's a number. But to get to that number, you have to evaluate the plus in order to figure out that you're adding the one and the two. And now you've figured out that you're cubing three. So we've called the eval a bunch of times, but we still haven't cubed anything. To cube something means to bind x to three and then evaluate this expression. So that will be the next step in terms of like calls to evaluate, it will be to evaluate this expression here. Hopefully that lines up, can't really tell, but probably close enough. What I'm evaluating is this thing up here. To evaluate that, I have to figure out what I'm calling uh, and what I'm calling it on. So the total number of calls to eval was one here, one, two, three, four, five, six, in order to get ready to call cube, and then another uh, one, two, three, four, five in order to call cube. So we have 12 in total. And maybe I solved the homework question for you, but that's fine. <laughs> but it's kind of amazing like how much recursion there is in an evaluator, but that's because like every little piece of the big expression needs to be evaluated in order to get the result. Um, so Aaron asks, can you go over apply for these expressions as well? Yeah. Uh, so. I guess the question is how many times does apply get called? Apply gets called whether you're applying a user defined procedure or a primitive procedure. Every time a call expression gets evaluated, uh, assuming there's no error along the way. So finding all the applies is a little bit easier. Uh, I think there's, well, I guess, what symbol <laughs> should I use? How about that? No. Uh, we applied once to do that. We applied again to do that. We applied again to do that. We applied again to do that. And down here, we didn't apply at all when we were defining cube, but we did apply the cube procedure and the plus procedure. So, you know, there's four applies to do this one and there's two applies to do that one. Uh, it does not involve apply when you reach a special form. Special forms are all handled by something other than apply. Apply is kind of the default case when you know it's not a special form, it's just a regular procedure call then you're going to be calling apply in order to apply the procedure to its arguments. And there's the times in the function, John. 
ho, ho, ho. Minus one for me. We do need to apply that. But following up on this, the, the one tricky part with apply is that if I were to call cube twice, then I would end up applying this twice. So if, for example, you know, this is going to screw up all my indentation. But if we had like cube cube or whatever, um, then not only do you have to apply the cube procedure twice, but since you're calling cube twice, you have to apply the times twice. So Sandra's asking in the chat, would the apply cube not take into account the times is, is the question. It is a different call to apply when you apply cube, which is like a procedure that will do something, but you know, the interpreter doesn't know what it is yet versus the second call to apply, which is when you're actually evaluating the body of cube and it's time to apply the times. So these are two different uh, applies and uh, you know, it, you're gonna have to apply the plus and then apply the cube to apply the times and then apply the cube to apply the times and you'll get, end up getting five applies in order to do this. this code. Okay, and somebody's asking the second print, the second print doesn't get applied. That's correct because- Oh yeah, so. So you can't just look at the code. You gotta think about what gets evaluated, but every time you evaluate a call expression, then you apply. Okay, we've finally drawn something that I think is coherent. Okay. The next question asked us to re-explain the last slide in the lecture, which was about string manipulation. Okay, so I showed you this slide with some descriptions of how to combine and manipulate strings in SQL, which is possible. You can concatenate strings together. You can get substrings. You can find things within strings. Um, I, there might be more stuff you can do with strings, but I guess just using those three pieces, you can do an awful lot. Strings can really represent anything. They can represent text. They could also represent code. They could represent um, like any kind of data it could kind of be written out in some kind of string form if you come up with a clever enough representation. And so for that reason, you can kind of store anything in a SQL table, but the kind of more clever you are about what you store inside of a string, the harder it's going to be to use that database later. So that was the idea behind these traffic lights, is that if you treat strings as a way of representing text, you'll almost never run into trouble because that's kind of what they were designed for originally. Um, if you um, then involve a lot of manipulating that text, like you come up with an expression that, uh, that, that doctors the text in interesting ways, well, sometimes that's a good idea because that's exactly what you need. But usually it's better to have like some other program doing this manipulation, something that uh, gives you a little bit better control over string manipulation. Like Python's a good string manipulation language. And what I don't recommend is that you try to use strings to represent some other data structure, like a list or an image or you know a snippet of code or something like that and then be manipulating that as if it were a list or an image or a snippet of code. Um, this can be done sometimes if you're clever. Um, so here's an example of trying to use a string to represent a whole list. And um, here we've like come up with a way of finding the second element in the list. But when you do this, you're usually making your database harder to use and your SQL code more complicated than it needs to be, it would instead be better to come up with some other way of representing the list. Um, for example, have each element in the list be its own row, as opposed to trying to squeeze it all into a string um, where it's much harder to access the pieces. One of the nice things about things like SQLite also, Audrey, is that you can incorporate them into other languages. So for example, there are Python hooks into SQLite, there are JavaScript hooks into it where you can query the database, get the data out and then do the manipulation there. You don't have to do everything in SQL. So these things interact in really nice ways. I tend to think of, I don't like doing um, database manipulations the way John has shown here. I prefer to have that be the storing of the data. I'll extract the data using Python, JavaScript, whatever it is and then do whatever I want to, to, to draw the inference. 
Yeah, like another reasonable thing is that maybe this should be a yellow light and this should be a red light and this should just be on fire or something like that. <laughs> it, it, it's a perfectly reasonable point of view to say like, look, uh, let the let the data manipulation happen elsewhere. There are reasons why you want SQL to do some work. Sometimes that is the most efficient way because kind of the the processing can happen where the data is in some cases. But uh, for most applications, I think it's better to have the application logic be outside of the database and uh, keep the database queries pretty simple. And um, on Friday in this optional lecture, which I would recommend, uh, we'll talk about how to get Python to interface with SQLite so you can kind of have both of them happening at the same time.